you. How do you? Um, all right, one minor correction to what you said. 30% uh, uh, of our weight isn't collagen because we're 70% water. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, 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 uh, but collagen is about 30% of the protein in our body, so it's very important. But uh, water is key too, so drink lots. Okay, <coughs> so uh, yeah, hopefully today I can introduce you to the, the, some of the physical properties of, of collagen. And um, just before I get started, uh, I'm curious how many of you have ever visited Simon Fraser University? Oh, good, quite a number of you. So for those who haven't, come and see us sometime. We're hosting CAP this year, the Canadian Association of Physicists Congress. Or drop by any time. SFU is in Vancouver, uh, just east of downtown Vancouver on top of Burnaby Mountain. Got lots of skiing, kayaking, hiking, big city stuff. It's a wonderful place, so if you're thinking about your next step in your student, go check us out next SFU. All right. So um, my lab works on a number of different topics um, at uh, the interface of sort of physics and chemistry and, and biology, uh, all pretty much molecular scale uh, questions, obviously in a colloquium I can't tell you about everything that we do. And so today what I'd like to focus on is really um, mechanics of uh, collagen as an example of a protein that forms beautiful hierarchical structures and materials. And as Claudio alluded, has a lot of um, mechanical roles to play in its function. So um, <coughs> to get us oriented, we're going to talk about the length scale that we're going to be talking about today. So SFU has a, a, a new observatory on campus. It's lovely. We don't actually have an astronomy program. So we use this for outreach and teaching and so on. Um, but what I really like is when they put it in, they did this whole landscaped area around it they call a science park, and it's all landscaped with really cool science themes. And my favorite part of this is these plaques in the ground here, which are the powers of 10 length scales. And so we start from one end of very short lengths. I don't know if you can actually read what's written on the plaque, so I wrote it out above, from uh, very short length scales all the way to very long length scales, and these are spaced in, in powers of 10. And so the area that I like to think about is right here in the middle. <laughs> what I love about physics is that it spans all of these length scales, right? Like what other discipline in science can say it does that? Um, right, so I like to think in the middle. And to give you a further orientation, I'm gonna show you a video that was produced by CERN um, in uh, Switzerland, looking, taking a voyage into a uh, hair and giving you a sense of the different length scales and organizational structures as we zoom in from the macro scale to the micro and nano scale. Okay, so <coughs> there we're, uh, we are. There's a scale bar at the bottom that shows you how we're progressing in length, and so all of these lengths should be familiar to all of you, um, but now we're getting down to the 100 micron length scale, which is about the diameter of a human hair, and now we're gonna see lengths that you might not have thought about in terms of hair. So we have the cells that formed the hair and the keratin molecules inside them. And we zoom in and you can see there's sort of structure at this subcellular level on the micrometer scale. We look at these macrofibrils. We're gonna zoom in some more and we see they're composed of microfibrils. We zoom in on the microfibrils and we see that they are composed of protofibrils. And we zoom in on the protofibrils, and we finally see a single protein, which in this case is keratin, about two nanometers in diameter or so. And so we can keep going in these uh, orders of magnitude length scales, and we start to see, of course, the atoms that make up the molecules, uh, zoom in yet further, um, and we start to see uh, the individual atoms, their electronic orbitals. And uh, we're gonna have to take a long voyage in now before we hit the nucleus. Yep, <laughs> here we go, <laughs> it's coming. <sighs> so this is not really so relevant to what I'm gonna talk about, but it's kind of impressive to see this sense of length scales played out this way, I think. Um, so 
Yeah, so there we are at the nucleus, and of course the nuclei, the protons and so on, are made up of quarks. So hopefully in that you've seen at least some representation of some of the physics that you yourself might think about. So uh, I'm going to focus on the protein level for the rest of this talk. And in, in the example of hair, the protein is the building block for hair. It's called keratin. Uh, the protein I'm going to talk to you about is called collagen. These are different proteins. They're made up of the same sort of molecular building blocks organized in different ways. But what's common between the two is that they form these hierarchical structures. So just like we saw for hair, the keratin makes these protofibrils, makes the microfibrils, makes the fibrils. Collagen, too, is an example of a protein that assembles in an extremely well-ordered fashion to make materials of different sizes and length scales, and then each of those performs important functional roles. Okay, so collagen is a protein similar in size, but it's different than keratin. But CERN didn't make a nice video about collagen, so I'm stuck showing you the one about hair. Any of you particle physicists out there who have connections, you can ask them to address this problem. Okay, um, so collagen is a protein, and it's really responsible for holding us together. We're not a puddle on the floor because we have three-dimensional structure in large part because of collagen. And uh, collagen is a large component of most of our connective tissues. In other words, the tissues in our bodies that connect one thing to another. So for example, uh, tendons which link the uh, muscle to the bone, or ligaments, or cartilage. Our eyes, the cornea, is arranged of collagen molecules that are arranged in a way that give beautiful optical properties and transparency to the visible light and so on. And it also forms what's called a matrix that surrounds our cells and it gives them important mechanical cues. It gives them a scaffolding in which to grow. So collagen has a lot of structural and mechanical roles and so we'd like to understand its mechanics. <coughs> um, the reasons for this are sort of fundamental knowledge of mechanics of building blocks, but also because of potential applications down the road. For example, cellular development, um, connective tissue function related to aging and how our tissues change their mechanics as we age. Our skin gets wrinkly, our bones break more easily. Um, and then also using collagen as a scaffold for new materials design and for designing new uh, you know, tissues and so on. And I like this um, photo because it highlights not only a, a famous former SFU student, but also gets at a variety of the pot potential applications. So here we see also a schematic of what does a fibril, a, a tendon look like if we were to zoom in on it the same way we zoomed in on the hair molecule. And so we can see that a tendon fiber, uh, well a tendon is made up of many fibers and each of those fibers is made up of fascicles which is made up of stacked, laterally stacked collagen fibrils which are in turn made up of the individual building blocks of collagen molecules, okay? So each of these is a different hierarchical scale, having different mechanical properties, but they're all made up of these building blocks. And tendons are 99% collagen. So that is the predominant building block of, a, of a, fiber, a tendon. And you could think of that as a rope-like structure. So a rope is made up of lots of little threads that are twisted together to make twine, and the twine is twisted together to make up slightly larger strings, and those get twisted together to make rope. You can think about that structure of hierarchical structure as, as akin to a tendon, all right? And so we want to look at those individual threads. And each collagen molecule or protein is about a nanometer or so in diameter, 300 nanometers in length, and it's a triple helix. So this is my physicist model of collagen. I have three rubber tubes just wrapped around each other to make a right-handed helical structure. So this is the thing I'm going to be talking to you about today, although, of course, it's really many orders of magnitude smaller in size. Okay, so we're gonna look at this molecular level, the smallest uh, sort of relevant building blocks, and I'm gonna tell you two stories. One has to do with the inherent flexibility of collagen, so how much does it bend under just thermal energies? That'll tell us something about its bending energy and how, how stiff it is. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll tell you about how it responds to force. So what happens to this triple helix when we stretch it? Okay, so flexibility of single collagen protein. 
before I go into what this parameter persistence length is, I want you to note that in the literature, this parameter called persistence length, which is used to tell us how flexible collagen is, is really not established. Okay, so you can see values ranging from 10 nanometers to 160 nanometers or so. Okay, so what is a persistence length? So this is a term we use for polymers. So if I have my collagen and it's, it's a 300 nanometer long contour length, meaning if I walk along it from one end to the other, it's 300 nanometers that I've traveled. So if this collagen is in solution, it might not be straight. It has some entrop entropic elasticity. It, it'll bend and flex and so on. And so the persistence length tells me if I start walking along the backbone, how long do I travel and my directionality persists, okay? So it's described by an exponential fall off of average uh, correlation of my tangent vectors. But essentially what this means is if I have a long persistence length, it means I travel a long way before I change direction. That means that my triple helix is relatively stiff or it has a high cost to bend. So a high bending stiffness or high bending energy. And if I have a shorter persistence length, that means that I travel shorter distance along the chain and I've changed direction. So that would be something that's much more flexible and we would expect to see a more compact structure in solution, okay? So if we then look at the actual values here for persistence length, we can see that at the short end, we have values that are saying we change direction every 10 nanometers or so. This is a highly flexible protein. And if we look at the other end of the scale, 160 nanometers means we're still probably going to be correlated by the end of this. So this is, would be a semi-rigid type of polymer. And so how we think about collagen is very different in these extremes. And we would like to have some idea of how flexible is collagen really? And understand, uh, you know, is there a reason for this discrepancy or are most of these values just plain wrong? Okay, why does this matter um, beyond just resolving a number? Um, so the implications of the flexibility of collagen are not just as material building blocks, knowing the individual mechanical properties of those, but understanding this in terms of protein structure. For example, if you're flexible and you breathe a lot, you can probably bend more easily than if you're locked in a rigid triple helix. So it gives you some sense of the dynamics. Uh, cell biology, this is relevant because collagen has to get sent out of cells. And it's very different to have to secrete something that's a rigid rod than a compact small coil. And then polymer physics, there are not a lot of experimental examples of these sort of semi-flexible chains that people have to play around with and test theories of polymer physics. So we want to know what's going on. So what we're going to do is image collagen molecules within the technique called atomic force microscopy. So um, this is an example image of collagen chains. And let me first tell you how uh, my students, Nahme and Aaron, obtain this. So you take your collagen molecules in solution. You deposit them on a very flat substrate. We use mica. Okay, so you put a drop of this on the mica. You we dry it so that it's easy to work with because it's dry. And then you come across uh, the surface with a cantilever that has a very sharp tip at the end of it. And this tip scans the substrate and measures uh, the forces. And if this deflects because it's running into something, then the little laser that's bouncing off the back of it will change its position on a photodiode. And that gives you then the readout of the deflection of the cantilever. So you can learn a lot about the interaction forces with the surface. That's where it's got its name, atomic force microscope. We're just gonna use it for topography, essentially. So you can take this image as being the height of things above the surface. So each yellow line here is one collagen molecule, and the orangish uh, color grainy is just the flat mica background, okay? So the first thing to notice is there's lots of yellow squiggles, and each of these yellow squiggles is about 300 nanometers long, which is the contour length of collagen. So this is good. This, this seems like what we're looking at what we think we ought to be looking at. And the other thing to notice is that they don't all look the same. Some of them are straighter than others. Some of them bend. They bend in different directions. This is also expected because there's thermal energy available to populate different conformations. So, okay, so we want to try and understand 
possible reasons for this discrepancy of persistent length of collagen. And so um, one possibility is that there's different types of collagens in different parts of our body. And those different parts of our bodies have different mechanical properties associated with the tissues. So maybe these different types of collagens have different mechanics at the individual molecular level. So we looked at a few different samples of different types of collagen. All of these have triple helical structures. Um, <coughs> one of them, type one, which is the predominant collagen in our bodies, is actually a homotrimer, or a heterotrimer, rather. So two chains have the same sequence, and one of them has a different sequence. And the other two, type two and three, have three chains that are all the same. And people have suggested in the literature that whether you're a homo or a heterotrimer might make a difference to how easy it is to bend and flex. We also looked at collagens um, that were either uh, derived from tissues, so they've been sitting around a while, potentially acquiring age-related modifications that might change their mechanics, versus ones that were freshly harvested from cells. So those were two possible or three possible explanations for why there might be variability in the mechanics. So we imaged all of these, and when I say we, I mean my former PhD student, Nahme, and a really talented undergraduate student, Aaron. And um, you can see squiggles in all of them that look about 300 nanometers long and a range of conformations. But it's hard to tell if they look really different or not, right, by eye. So we have to be quantitative and physical about this. So <coughs> what we need to do is we need to analyze these conformations and learn about the, how much bending is allowed at this room temperature thermal energy scale um, that went into these snapshots of, of, the, of the conformational ensembles. And to do that, we need to be able to parametrize their backbone and figure out how much the contours are changing. So Nahme developed a, a really nice image analysis algorithm she calls Smart Trace where in an image, a user can come along and select a few points near a backbone, and then this is using a correlation-based algorithm <coughs> and sort of marching along the backbone and refining the guess of where it's going until it gets the best score. And so the red line in the middle here would be the, 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 um, the backbone that we have established for this particular collagen molecule. And we validated this algorithm both on DNA, which is very well characterized, so sort of from an experimental standpoint, and also through a lot of uh, simulated images of polymers of given properties. So we're pretty sure that our technique works very well for our purposes. Okay, so now we can get the backbones. We need to do some statistical analysis on them. And so <coughs> what we're gonna do is interpret our results in terms of what's called a worm-like chain. So if we take a rod, a simple physical rod, there's three main modes of deformation. You could stretch it and extend it. That would have some stretch modulus associated with it. You can bend it. That would have some bending energy or bend modulus associated with it. And you can twist it. And generally, what's assumed and what has worked very well for other polymers like DNA, for example, is that you assume that the bending modes are the most easy to access from an energetic standpoint. And so you will see bending deformations at room temperature, but you won't see very much twist or stretch happening. <coughs> so we're gonna use the inextensible worm-like chain model that talks about the conformation simply in terms of bending modes, okay? And we're gonna describe those in terms of the persistence length that I mentioned already. So deviations from going in a straight line are because we've ab able to bend and walk around. So now if we have our confirmation of our chain, shown here, an example one, what we wanna do is we wanna take pairs of points on the backbone separated by some distance along the contour, which I'll call S. And we can uh, look at two, two features of these. One is how far do we have to travel through space for these two points separated by distance S along the backbone? That's R, so we can look at R squared as a function of S. And the other is look at the tangent vectors at those two locations and see how much did the tangent vector reorient uh, over this contour length S. And that's shown here. So we look at the dot product between these or the cosine. And we have to look at the average, ensemble average properties of these over many, many measurements of this because this is a thermally activated stochastic process. So we wanna find the average R squared and the average 
um, cosine of the theta. And then these equations are then the predictions that the worm-like chain model says. So it says, how I can, if you tell me what the persistence length of your chain is, then I can tell you how R squared is going to depend on S or how close theta will depend on S. And here we see indeed that the uh, tangent correlation uh, falls off exponentially uh, as a function of the persistence length. And the factor of two is here because all of our images are collected in two dimensions. Okay, so we, we correct for that. All right, so if we look at our data, so we plotted those here versus uh, segment length, and the circles are the estimates with the error bars giving our standard deviation of our, of our measurements. You can see that the models, which are the solid lines, describe the data very well. So it looks like describing collagen as a worm-like chain is a pretty good uh, model to use. And we can see that the persistence lengths that we get out of these two independent fits um, <coughs> agree with each other pretty well. So this is, this is nice. All right, so it seems like if describing collagen as a worm-like chain is pretty good, and we get a persistence length of about 100 nanometers from this sample. This was kind of in the middle of the range that I showed you before that went from like 10 nanometers up to 160 or so, <coughs> maybe a bit on the high end. So this is a data point. But is it a good data point or is it not so good a data? It's just another number to put in my table, right? So let's compare now the different types of collagen from these different sources and see if they help us to solve the mystery. How much does this persistence length vary among these different collagens? Answer, not, not very much. So uh, here are the different types, heterotrimers and homotrimers from different sources. And you could argue there is some variation, but on the whole, these are all around, say, 90 nanometers or so, 10% variation about that, roughly. So neither of these factors seems to be a huge indicator for how flexible collagen is at the molecular level. Okay, so what else could there be? So around the time we were doing this work, there was a paper published that was uh, imaging collagen, and they imaged it. Um, after depositing it from a sort of a high salt neutral pH condition and an acidic water condition with basically no salts, and they look very different, these, these conformations. And so we thought maybe, maybe chemical environment matters. Let's vary independently salt in a careful way, pH, and see uh, what happens to collagen. So here are example images of collagen deposited under varying concentrations of potassium chloride. So low salt and increasing the amount of salt to the high end. The images I showed you previously were obtained in higher salt conditions. You can see in the higher salt, collagens tend to be on the whole straighter. And in the low salt, they tend to be more compact. Oh. Salt seems to be having an effect. Let's analyze these data in terms of this worm-like chain model and see how the flexibility now depends on the salt concentration. So that's what we see here, persistence length versus ionic strength plotted on a log scale. The blue dots correspond to these conditions. The red dots are the same salt concentrations but in acid, and over here is water. And we can see there is a strong effect of salt on the persistence length or the bending flexibility of collagen. Going from more flexible to more rigid as we increase the salt. <coughs> this was surprising to us thinking about collagen as a potential polyelectrolyte um, with charges and the effect of screening those charges with higher salt. The trend is opposite, for example, than what's seen with DNA uh, when you look at its salt-dependent persistence length. But more than this, oh, I should mention one more thing, is that the range of these persistence lengths goes from about 30 nanometers up to 120 nanometers. So while this doesn't cover the whole range of the literature, we're getting pretty close. Tuning from this lower flexibility to, or higher flexibility, more compact, to lower flexibility, more extended, simply by tuning the knob of salt. So maybe that is a contributing factor to what's going on. Okay. However, this is not the whole story here. So if you look at these conformations, particularly at low salt, 
what you'll see is that they're new, they don't see, it doesn't seem like collagen is randomly squiggling back and forth and changing direction randomly on a 40 nanometer length scale. Instead, it kind of looks more like it's just looping. Okay. And if we look at the individual traces, that we fit, the cosine, theta, and the R squared, like I showed you before, in these conditions, the model does not describe those data very well at all. There's strong deviation, um, particularly visible at long segment lengths, so separations between points on the chain. And if we look at the correlation of the tangent vectors, it actually goes significantly negative, meaning anti-correlated as if you start out heading in one direction and after a while you turn around and you're heading in the opposite direction. This is not what you would expect for a standard formalized chain. So um, we were puzzling about this for a while. We thought maybe there's curvature involved. Maybe the chains, instead of being inherently straight, as they seem to be at high salt, maybe at low salt, they're actually inherently curved. And then we're seeing sort of fluctuations away from this. Okay, so maybe there's curvature there. And um, so Aaron, this undergrad, derived actually the equivalent equations as these, expressions as these, for what we would expect if collagen had an inherent curvature. So if the whole chain were really wanted to be a circle with some radius uh, curvature, and uh, then we have thermally activated fluctuations away from them. So the persistence length describes uh, deviations away from this zero energy conformation. So for the cos theta, what happens? <coughs> you simply add this cosine term in front that includes this K naught, kappa naught curvature, okay? And if we look at a fit to this model, it does far better. This describes the data really well. We now have two parameters, right? We, we have our curvature, and we have our persistence length. So this seems to, to describe what's going on better. Uh, he derived a similar expression for R squared. It's a lot messier, <laughs> a lot more terms. Um, but we can fit the data with this equation. <coughs> and we also find a significantly enhanced fit. The values don't agree perfectly between these two uh, measures. So this may not be the whole story, but a number of statistical tests tell us that including curvature gives us far better fit to our data than not. So it really seems like um, what seems to be regulated by salt is the curvature of collagen. And so now we can look at how does the curvature behave as a function of ionic strength and also how does the persistence length behave as a function of ionic strength. And we see that there's not as strong a variation in the persistence length. Whereas the uh, curvature, it, collagen stay curved and then gradually become straightened as we increase the ionic strength. And so the picture we should have is going from something that might look like this at low salt and low pH to something that's becoming straight as we increase the salt and or pH. What we don't know yet is whether this is what's happening in solution or not because our measurements are on an interface, right? So it could be that in solution, collagen is going from this to this. It could also be that in solution, collagen is going from some sort of a superhelical structure at low salt to something straight. And then when we project this down and let it settle on a flat interface, it becomes curved. It could also be that interactions with the interface are what are responsible for the curvature. So there was a recent paper out by um, Peter Olmsted at Georgetown that suggested any time you have a chiral polar molecule, in other words, one that has a directionality and a twist, if it has some energetic interaction with the interface, what can happen is as it goes to lie down on that interface, it, uh, it's gonna choose to compete between, say, unwinding or overwinding the chain, which costs it some twist energy, but it could gain an adhesion energy to the substrate. And if you follow a chiral polar molecule along, as it wants to do this, uh, 
sacrificing some twist energy in order to gain with interfacial energy, you end up with a structure that is curved. So it could be that the curved structures we see are because of interactions with the interface. Um, they certainly seem to be equilibrated structures, looking at angular distributions and so on. Everything looks Gaussian. So we think we're probing an equilibrated state, but whether it's an equilibrated state that we'd see in solution or it's an equilibrated state given the substrate we're on is something that we're working on as well. Okay, so <coughs> that brings me to the close of the first uh, of the two messages which have to do with the inherent flexibility of collagen. And really what we're, we're doing with this work and how we're progressing forward is um, looking for potentially other systems that the curved worm-like chain model is applied to. So to our knowledge, no one has ever really formulated and used this to describe any other system. And there are examples of other curved images in the literature or images of curved molecules that it might be well suited to describe. And then we've also been looking at the sequence dependent flexibility of collagen. So everything I told you, you treated them as homogeneous rods uh, where every bit is the same as every other, but it's a protein and there's variations in the sequence along the backbone. So the chemistry changes as you walk along the backbone. And so we've adapted our smart trace and a new student, um, Ala, has been imaging a different type of collagen called type four, which has conveniently a blob on one end. So we now know which end is which of the collagen. And so we can look at the flexibility as a function of distance from this blob. <coughs> and then look at that in many different molecules and figure out how does <coughs> the local flexibility or persistence length vary along the chain. And what she's found is there's three regions along the chain where the Persistence length seems high, uh, like with the fibrillar collagens I told you about, types one, two, and three, or around 90 nanometers or so. But then there's dips, and it becomes more flexible, more rigid, more flexible, more rigid, and then towards this end, it's highly flexible. And it turns out that type four is a very different type of collagen. Yes, it has triple helical domain, but rather than forming these rope-like structures, it forms like a lattice-like uh, network, like a, a hammock or a fishing net or something, right? So it, it interacts differently, it doesn't stack laterally. But also, its triple helix is not contiguous. So if you walk along, oops, uh, the backbone of each of its three chains, you'll see she's marked here in, in rectangles, those regions that have the right sequence of amino acids to form a good triple helix. But they're, the repetitive sequence of amino acids that forms triple helix has missing bits. And so you have different amino acids in some of these regions. And if you look at where are the interruptions in the triple helix, they seem to correlate with these dips uh, in uh, persistence length. In other words, having regions where you can't form a triple helix, it looks like it's much easier to bend. And that kind of makes sense even with a rubber tube model. If I take my three chains that are wrapped around each other, I can't bend this as easily as I can if I just have three chains side by side. And at this end of the molecule, there's a lot of interruptions and it is highly flexible. So this is something we're, we're starting to look at, is to learn more about collagen, not only as a rod, but as a protein. Okay, so in the remaining few minutes, I'm gonna tell you a somewhat shorter story about how does collagen respond to force, okay? So when we stretch it. And this is relevant <coughs> because in a lot of our tissues, collagen is repeatedly loaded and unloaded. So every time I step and my muscle contracts, my tendon is loaded, right? Stretching, applying force and relaxing. And so collagen is constantly being strained and loaded in our bodies. How does this influence its, mechanic, its, its structure? <coughs> so there's three possibilities that we could consider at low force for, again, this lowest level of structure within our tendon. One possibility, and I'm gonna talk about low forces here for those of you who think about biological forces, I'm talking below 10 piconewtons. For the rest of you, I'm talking about forces where for DNA, nothing happens structurally. So when you stretch DNA below 10 piconewtons of force, all that happens is you straighten it. You don't deform it in any way. So one possibility for collagen is the same thing happens. We just take these wiggles, the bends that we could have had from thermal energy and we just straighten out the backbone. But we don't deform anything. That's the middle option. 
simply entropic elasticity, no change in the structure. But another possibility is that it doesn't cost very much energy to start deforming it. And when we stretch it, one possibility is that the helix could tighten and become even more stable. And another possibility is that it could loosen and become destabilized. And because this is collagen, uh, all three options have been found in the literature. And there is no consensus on what happens under force. So again, we thought we would try to apply some of these single molecule techniques to address this problem. So evidence for the tightening and the loosening have come from really cool experiments um, giving contradictory results, but similarly structured from the Dunn Lab at Stanford and Roberti Lab at Northeastern University. And what they did was they stretched collagen molecules, single collagen molecules with an applied force, and they added in an enzyme into solution. That's shown by these pacnans. And the enzymes they used have evolved to be able to cut triple helical collagen. They're called collagenases, for cutting collagen enzymes. And so what they found, the Dunn Lab, um, they used an enzyme called matrix metalloprotease, and they found that as they stretched collagen, its cleavage rate by this enzyme got faster. So they said, okay, collagen is getting cleaved more easily as I'm stretching it. That must mean that the triple helix is destabilized. Okay. The Ruberti lab used a different collagenase, so a different enzyme, bacterial collagenase, that evolved to, has evolved to cleave triple helix collagen. And when they pulled on collagen and looked at how quickly it got cleaved as a function of force, they saw that pulling on collagen turned off cleavage. And so they said, aha, collagen must be tightening when we stretch. Okay, so... And there is also evidence for no change at all. So uh, we, we came at this, and I have an incredibly talented student who's just wrapping up his PhD. And uh, he came at this and said, well, hey, you know, those guys have used these enzymes as probes that are supposed to interact with triple helical collagen. So they're not really inert probes, if you will, for the structure, because they could be actively unwinding or doing other things. Let's use a different probe. And so Mike had the idea to use trypsin. So trypsin is another example of an enzyme that can cut proteins, but it can cut proteins only if it can access their chains. And it has been used as sort of the benchmark study in the collagen field for decades to determine if a triple helix is stable. Because if you have collagen as a tr stable triple helix, trypsin cannot cut it. And if you heat your collagen and denature it, for example, turn it into gelatin or whatever, you make these strands accessible, trypsin can cut them up, no problem. So this is a really accepted study in the collagen community for stability. And he thought, let's do the same kind of thing, stretch collagen and look at how quickly it's cleaved by an applied force, but we're gonna use trypsin as the probe. Because <clears throat> that should really tell us if a strand is becoming accessible on its own. So uh, to do that, you need to apply force to collagen. So what we can imagine doing is taking our collagen, doing some chemistry to attach it to a glass cover slip, and then dangling a heavy bead on the other end. If you do your chemistry right, you can get a single collagen tethered, tethering the surface and the bead. And if this bead is denser than water, it's going to hang down under gravity, and we'll be able to stretch it with a force. Okay? And then we could add in our enzymes. Uh, and see what happens. And what's nice about this particular idea is that you could have a whole bunch of these beads tethered by collagen molecules. And you look at them in a microscope, and all you see is a whole bunch of beads in the same plane of focus because they're all held by collagen. You add your enzyme, and beads are going to fall down under gravity as soon as this tether is broken. And so your experiment becomes just counting beads in your sample chamber as a function of time under this whatever force, 1G acceleration force of your beads. Um, the issue becomes that if you want to change the force, then you have to use different beads, maybe bigger beads or denser beads or whatever, and do your chemistry all over again. And although I have a background in chemistry and physics, I really don't like to do more chemistry than I have to, so it'd be nicer to use the same beads. 
So can we do this with the same beads and apply more force? Answer, yes. Okay, so let's imagine we do this. We shrink our little thing down just so that I can see. And instead of it just sitting there under gravity, what if we start to spin it? Okay, so we spin our sample. And now we can control the force that's acting on the sample simply by how fast we spin it. Okay. So we have some radius of rotation, mass of our beads, and then we're controlling the rate of, rate of rotation. And this is the idea behind the centrifuge force microscope. And the centrifuge force microscope, or CFM, was first uh, developed by Wesley Wong and Ken Halverson um, almost 10 years ago now. And their uh, initial design had like this meter long metal rebar that was kind of balanced cleverly at a given point. And a uh, light source and objective lens and camera that they could move around and then this whole meter long thing would spin around. He shows these movies of these when he gives talks and it's really cool but kind of frightening. Uh, so I said to Mike, who at the time was an undergrad in my lab, Mike, can you build this? This would be awesome. This would be a great way to do parallel single molecule force spectroscopy. He said, sure. I knew Mike was really good at instrumentation. He came back to me a week later and said, no. Mike, come on, this seems really cool. I said, no, 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 I'm not gonna do that. That seems crazy. I'm gonna miniaturize it. Centrifuges are commercial devices used in all sorts of molecular biology labs that are designed to spin things. And they balance things as long as you get the mass to match. So I'm just gonna build a miniature microscope instead and put it in a centrifuge and have the centrifuge do the work. Okay, great, go ahead, do it. That sounds good to me. And so he did. And so he made a mini CFM. So just for a sense of scale here, this is a centrifuge and it has little buckets that you can put things in and these buckets swing so that when it starts swinging up, they go out. It's kind of like those swing rides at the, at the fairgrounds, except it doesn't tilt too. Um, so this is a little, uh, whoops, wireless <coughs> microscope. Uh, I'll show you an expanded view on the next stage, but it plops into one of these buckets to spin. At the bottom, there's an LED light source that's battery powered. Then we have our sample chamber, objective lens, um, and then a tube and a camera at the top that's also battery powered and that sends out a radio frequency signal. So it's just sending it out through the air we have a little receiver that we sit on the centrifuge that picks up the signal and then sends it to a USB digitizer on the laptop that's sitting nearby. So in real time, we can sit and look at the laptop and look at exactly what is going on in our microscope as it's spinning around at like 1,000 feet. So this is what it looks like, a little battered from many uses. It's about 20 centimeters tall, quite light so that it fits the specs of the centrifuge. Um, an image from the microscope up here. And what uh, is impressive is that we can maintain a, a constant focal plane over a thousand G of acceleration. Um, and it's real time video rate wireless communication. So we have no buffering problems. We're not doing onboard storage. It's just continuous streaming. And the whole thing costs under $500. So that's pretty nice. So, uh, and what's also nice is that we can do like many parallel single molecule force measurements. So each of these beads is one single molecule force measurement. So instead of optical tweezers, which my lab has also developed, where you stretch one molecule at a time, now you're doing hundreds or more. Okay, so uh, quick quiz uh, in the last few minutes, which do you think has the highest acceleration? R CFM, space shuttle during liftoff, luge rider, or uh, NASCAR, okay? Which is the highest? Uh, NASCAR, space shuttle, luge, CFM. Okay, so CFM is right, thousand G. Any guesses which the second? Hmm? Luge, anyone else? The luge is the next highest. So uh, it's about 5G or so as you go around one of the corners. NASCAR and F1000 get pretty close. Space shuttle's about 3G. The body should not be subjected to 5G for extended periods of time. So uh, our CFM's going pretty high. Okay, 
So back to the collagen story in the last couple of minutes. So what I'm going to show here is an image, uh, a series of images. Um, they've been um, processed a bit for, for clarity from a real experiment. So this movie is going to play 10 times real time. These images are from the microscope as it is spinning, in this case at about 100 G. Um, so the force of about nine piconewtons acting to pull the beads away from the surface and stretch the collagen. Each bead is going to be tethered to the surface by a collagen molecule and trypsin is present. So if trypsin can cleave the collagen, we expect the beads to be able to detach and fly out of our field of view to the other side of the sample chamber where we just won't see them because we're not close to them. Okay? So let's watch the movie 10 times real time so that we get done in time. Um, <coughs> and what you can see is, hopefully, beads are detaching from the surface. And so as we go, spinning, constant force on the collagen, things are popping. So this suggests that we're able to cleave collagen in these conditions. Okay? So we can take snapshots at sort of zero minutes and 20 minutes after adding trypsin. <coughs> And we can see from the CFM that we have lots of beads going to very few beads, right? That's what you were watching in the movie. And then we can do the exact same experiment in a microscope in the, in the lab under just 1G, so very low force, essentially zero, and see what happens. And when we do that, what we see is very few beads disappear. So it seems from these data, like what's going on is that the trypsin under force is accelerating the cleavage of collagen. And we can look at this as a function of time, not just snapshots, and get um, the fraction of beads remaining as a function of time, and then we fit this. It, it's well described by a single exponential. Okay, so this really looks like what's happening is that the collagen uh, cleavage is accelerated by force. We apply force, and collagen is getting cut faster, right? There's one control experiment we have to do, because we don't know the trypsin is causing these beads to come off the surface. It could just be that they're getting yanked off the surface by force. So we have to repeat these experiments with no trypsin and see what happens. When we do that, it's going to get a little bit messier in the plot. We have the open circles. So this is with force and with no trypsin. So we are losing beads from the surface, but we're not losing them as fast a rate. And so we can fit all of these with a model for what's falling off the surface. And the end, the upshot, the conclusion is we get these rates that are due to the presence of trypsin corrected for detachment uh, non-specifically. And we find about a 20-fold enhancement of the rate of collagen cleavage by force. So this suggests then that what is happening is that as we stretch collagen, it does get destabilized by force and the triple helix becomes more accessible. I'd also like to point out for the single molecule aficionados like Claudio, look at these ends. We're getting 12,000 single molecule measurements. This is great for statistics. <laughs> <laughs> so normally people quote like 10, maybe 100, but this is a really nice technique to get much higher number statistics. Okay, so in the last like minute, I'm just going to loop back to the big picture because everything I've told you about is collagen in isolation. But in our tissues and our tendons, it's surrounded by other collagen. So what the heck is, does, how does this relate to what's going on when we walk? We don't know. So we don't know how much force a single collagen sort of thread within our tendon experiences. But there was a recent study that tried to look at what is happening in collagen when you stretch a tendon. And so they took a single fascicle of collagen and they, um, uh, that's one of these guys, and they stretched, stretched it straight and beyond straight. So they strained it to different amounts of extension past its regular length. And then they added in a particular dye uh, that will bind only to collagen when it's strained, and deformed, I mean. So it can only bind if you disrupt the collagen triple helix. So we're gonna look for the amount of green color as a function of strain. And we can see here they've actually, they wrapped the fascicle around like this because it was too big to fit in their image. And you can see that higher amounts of strain lead to more staining, meaning more molecular level disruption of collagen. So our tendons don't normally experience this much strain, 
Uh, but there is a little bit of strain, uh, staining at lower levels. And what was really nice for us is that they compared the amount of collagen that could be digested by trypsin with the amount of labeling that they saw and showed that these were comparable. So there's some efforts being made to try to now bridge this gap between molecular and higher order structure. So with that, I'll conclude. I'll just leave up the conclusions. I'll acknowledge my whole research group. This was us back in April. Um, I've highlighted the people who did the actual experiments when I talked about them, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you have.